Gerard Berkman from uh, Via Transportation, among the algorithms and data uh, team. And I'm going to give a brief talk that tries to uh, explain a different approach to data science that we applied in the company. Okay, so I'll give a quick overview of what we're going to discuss. First of all, before I go into what we are going to discuss, I'm not going to discuss neural nets. So <laughs> anyone, I think I'll be the only one today. Um, so we'll start with some background, which is relevant to, to the rest of the talk about the automotive industry and the changes that it's uh, going through. Um, then I'll give a quick uh, problem statement or what exactly we're trying to solve and how we, and then uh, how we're going to address uh, the problem. And uh, in the very last part, if we have time, we can discuss uh, future steps or why there's still so much to do. Okay. So um, I don't know how many of you are aware of this, but the automotive industry is going through a huge shift in the last few years. If you're looking back historically, then at the very beginning of the 20th century, um, there were 20 million horses in the world, uh, carriages, and that was a popular form of transportation. There's a famous quote from the Times Magazine from just before the end of the century, that uh, in 50 years, every road in London is going to be covered with horse manure. And 30 years later, uh, <coughs> It had almost all but disappeared. And uh, the industry was completely taken over, taken over by cars. If you look at the industry today, then there are almost 1.2 billion private cars across the world, millions of buses. And there's a feeling that, this is, that we're on the verge of another revolution in this area. And, and, and it's enough to look at the markets. You can see that the largest privately held startup today is in this area. Uh, as Israelis, we all know, Mobileye was just bought by Intel. So it's definitely a huge market that's going through a very uh, dramatic revolution. The revolution means that transport is becoming on demand. You download an app, you order a car, and it comes and picks you up wherever you are. Shared uh, ways and move it to come out with versions where you can share your ride. Uh, electric cars and uh, obviously autonomous cars. And this is a huge shift that the industry is undergoing, and VIA is a part of this shift. So I'm going to give a quick overview of what we're trying specifically at VIA to do, and where, what our focus is. Um, so someone opens his app and orders a vehicle, and we're going to try and get him to his destination, more or less as quickly and efficiently as we can on the one hand, but try and aggregate him and uh, add an extra people to the ride. The way we do this is obviously calculate a route for that rider. We may ask him to walk a little because it's obviously much more efficient if he walks to us than instead of going into, for instance, a side street. And uh, the system online is trying to detect and, and find other riders with similar attributes or similar routes so that we can uh, aggregate them together. The, the, the most important thing about this is if you think about the problem this way, then it's very clear that Probably the most important KPI for VIA is uh, what we call utilization, uh, and, and what we can all think of as just the number of riders per van per hour. Uh, specifically, a very large portion of VIA is fixed price, so the more riders we can put on a, van, on a vehicle in a given uh, ride, the more profitable we are, and that's what we're going to try and understand. I'll just uh, discuss uh, the algorithmic challenge that, that we face doing this. Um, so if you think of it for a single rider, there are hundreds of possible vehicles across the city and dozens of possible pickup points because we allow the rider to walk a certain distance and dozens of possible drop-offs along uh, th where we can obviously drop the rider off. And uh, that creates thousands of possible combinations for a single rider. Now when you think of it, when we're trying to aggregate multiple riders over multiple vehicles, this becomes a NP-hard uh, problem that we have to solve in real time, um, especially once we take uh, uncertainty in speeds, for instance, throughout the city into account. Uh, the point of the slide is try and convince you that it's a difficult problem. Um, I hope that worked. And um, VIA solution is constantly improving and evolving, and we're trying to get better at it because it's such a difficult problem, based on all sorts of feedback and uh, our own insights. And once we understand that the problem is difficult and 
um, what we're trying to measure, uh, a key question becomes how do we actually understand whether we're in the right, doing or making changes and uh, progressing in the right direction. So as I said at the beginning, the key performance indicator we're trying to assess is utilization of the number of riders per van per hour. And if you think of it, that's a very, very high level um, measure. It's, we look over, for instance, a morning in New, in New York. On average, how many riders we manage to get into a vehicle in an hour. But all the changes we're actually doing to the system are on a very, very low level. It can be changes to codes. We can add a new feature. Uh, we can change the parameters we're using. Um, we can go out in a marketing com campaign in a certain area uh, and just growth in general. And, and this creates a, a dissonance between the two, two levels. On the one hand, all the changes are on a very low level. But the, the indicator we're at, or the measure we're actually trying to, to understand is on a very high level. And it's often very, very difficult to translate and convert the changes on the very low level uh, to the high level. And we have to do this very quickly and efficiently, uh, preferably reliably. Otherwise, we'll make mistakes along the way. So, so that's uh, the problem that uh, I'm going to address. And well, th this is PyData. And we're all, or at least most of us, are data scientists. So we'd all approach, I hope, approach a problem in the same way and just uh, Look at the data and try and understand when we make a change what's happening in real life. Um, and that's what we also try to do. But reality is difficult and there's a lot of noise. So I'll just give some examples of noise. Um, New York City Marathon. And then half the city is closed and we, we can't drive on our normal routes. Obviously, that will have some impact on citywide utilization. Holiday, Thanksgiving, summer, vacation, all these things create um, a lot of noise in our measurements, and it's very difficult to, uh, uh, which are much larger than the effects that we're changing on a day-to-day -day basis. So it's, and obviously this is a problem that we all face all the time, trying to detect relatively small uh, changes in the, uh, when we have a huge amount of noise. And other examples, weather, for instance, when it's raining, people are more likely to take a ride because they don't want to walk. Or when it's snowing, people are less likely to leave the house. And uh, I won't go through all of them. Competition, sometimes when uh, there's a surge in a, different, in a competitor, then, then people are more likely to take a year. Um, another problem with looking at the data is that the system, or it's a similar problem, is that the system is non-stationary. We're constantly evolving and changing so that it's not like we can say, OK, we've got, just let's look over the last six months. There's a lot of noise, but it will more or less cancel out. That's not actually true, because all the changes that we're adding to the system over time, hopefully, if we're doing our job well, also create a trend throughout the data, which make it very difficult to isolate a specific uh, event or a specific change. Uh, another way to think of that is, is that we're actually doing a, a very small data problem. If, you, if we change the code every few days and we only get a few measurements that, that we're trying to explain. And the last problem, which is actually we're not going to solve anyway, but, but is always relevant when we're look at, looking at the data, is that um, we're not necessarily representative, or we've got to buy a sa sample because we can only understand what we've already tried and what's happening in, in, in life. Uh, we can try and extrapolate, but that extrapolation may not be accurate. This is just an example to give you some sense of, of a noise. Every line is a different shift throughout, or different time frame throughout the day, and every the data point is, is, a, is a different day, and you can see that the, the scale of the noise is very, very large. Okay. Um, so the next thing to do is to try and experiment. We can try and experiment so as to control for the effects and, and reduce the noise. So yeah, we're looking at average utilization throughout the city, yeah. Um, the problem with the experimentation is we can think of it in, if we're going to try and experiment on a large scale, on a lot of vehicles, um, then there's a high, or a lot of riders, then there's a high risk. If we made a mistake, we, we, we could have an adverse effect on a large group of people or a large, uh, and create an unpleasant uh, experience. On the other hand, if we're going to use a very small scale, then because there's so much noise, um, we won't get a significant uh, observation. The other issue is that VR, as I said before, is, is, you c can be thought of in some way as trying to do a global optimization. We have lots of vehicles and lots of riders, and it's very difficult to isolate a specific group. For instance, if we try and change parameters for a specific group, another, the control group may, behavior in the control group may be different than 
if we hadn't isolated the first group without, uh, without any change. Uh, and certainly when, when, I went, when we're thinking of system-wide features, all, so, all sorts of features that actually have very uh, large effect over the whole system, then uh, um, we can't just test um, half the system. It's, it b becomes very difficult. Yes, sorry. Yeah, the uh, the right of the utilization would, like would increase. increase. Which would is increase. The, the utilization would increase because we get there faster and we can take more riders in a given time. Assuming that you have like an, an increased supply of riders. Right? Correct. Correct. Um, but there are other metrics. Uh, some of them are also very important, but I think uh, I'm not going to get through everything I'm intending to anyway, so we, we try to focus on, on utilization, which is the most important measure we're usually looking at. Uh, good question, sorry. Uh, and um, the other problem with uh, experimentation, it's often very expensive. We first have to implement the whole feature, uh, deploy it with all the costs and test it, and only then do we get some feedback as to whether we're doing okay or not. And it's also often very difficult to actually understand long-term effects. If we changed, for instance, in via the maximal walking distance, and it didn't have an immediate effect, but it increased the chance of someone not riding with us over six months, we'd have absolutely no way of just waiting six months and, and seeing what the result is. So we do what quite a lot of you, I assume, do, and we use simulation. We have a very high fidelity and heavy simulation in, in the system, and the huge advantage of simulation is we can keep everything static and the same, and use that uh, and, and just look at how our specific change, uh, what, th what that caused. Um, the problem with simulation, first of all, it's very heavy. It requires a lot of maintenance to keep it up to date with the actual pro uh, system. And it's also very prone to uh, garbage in, garbage out. Often we don't actually know what the real behavior is going to be. And then we make some assumptions, hopefully good assumptions, but unfortunately sometimes we make mistakes. And it becomes very difficult to, 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 to get uh, um, reliable results. So, okay, so, so that was just a, a pretty long uh, introduction to our problem and why uh, none of the simple uh, solutions, uh, or not so simple, uh, straightforward solutions uh, actually work. And I want to go back to this Venn diagram, which hopefully you've all seen uh, so many times that you're sick of looking at it. And, and we are at PyCon, so almost all the lectures are probably about hacking skills, and some of us are uh, talking about math and statistics knowledge and all sorts of cool packages in Python that allow us to implement them. But I'm going to discuss the bottom uh, circle, which we don't often discuss, which is sub substantive expertise or domain knowledge. Uh, and we don't like discussing it because we tend to think that my domain knowledge is in ride sharing and it's completely irrelevant to your domain knowledge, which is in cybersecurity or fraud or finance. So it's irrelevant. And I will try and convince you that that's not always the case. Okay. So the way to do this or to think of this is how would a physicist approach the problem? So what we're trying to understand is the utilization, the number of rides per hour per vehicle. And I, I, my, I'm originally a physicist, so the first thing you try to do when you get a problem is try and build a very, very simple model. So um, to do that, the first question you ask is what features do we expect to have an impact? So the, in our case, there may be very, very many of them, but we're trying to isolate some key um, parameters or, or measures that, that, that we expect to, to have a large effect on the model. Then we try and understand what sort of influence they'd have, okay? What sort of influence, and if we're really domain experts, then we may even be able to estimate what sort of behavior to expect. And the thing here is that after we have that, we can build a very, very simple toy model, okay? And, and the key to toy models is keeping it simple. If it's a complicated model, it, it, it may work, but it, it's not exactly what I'm trying to discuss. So we're trying to, d to understand the utilization, and if you, even if you just look at the unit utilization is uh, riders per van per hour. So let's build a very basic model which says that the utilization is just equal to the demand, the number of riders per hour, divided by the supply. Okay? That's a very first order approximation. If we're a little smarter, and Louis actually hinted at this, then we, we'll add the speed because the effective number of vans is dependent on the speed in the city. If we're driving at higher speeds, then each van can collect more people. So, so this is a very, very basic model. And before anyone says anything, I don't think any of you would have, but still, um, George Buck said, uh, all models are wrong. Okay? I know this model is 
wrong. Okay, just I'll give an example. If this were the way our system behaved, then we'd expect taxis and via that do taxis are single rider per vehicle and via which does preferably multiple riders per vehicle. All these metrics would be exactly the same and we'd get the exact same estimation. So the model is obviously wrong, but I claim it's useful. And okay, so we've got this very, very simple model. And it, we can take it and actually use the data to try and calibrate the model. So what we did is we took uh, over a few months, a uh, period of a few months, and using sklearn, we just built a very, very simple model where we claim that the, log, the logarithm of the utilization is equal to a linear model um, using the log of the demand, the log of the supply, and the log of the speed as features. The reason we're using, using logs, it's very common in physics, is because we... The model, the very simple model we build is multiplicative. So a linear model on the logarithms will allow us to get a multiplicative model uh, of the features. Okay. <laughs> but useful. Um, uh, technical help, please? Okay, um, so, so I'll just carry on discussing briefly. Um, we use this model, and what we're trying to calibrate is the powers. When we use a, a, a logarithmic, a, a linear model for the logarithms, then it allows us to estimate the powers of each of the, uh, of the features. So in this case, the actual uh, equation we're using, or we're trying to estimate, is the utilization is equal to some constant, which isn't very interesting in this case, times the demand to alpha, times the supply to beta, and times by the speed to a certain power ga gamma. And when we know these powers, uh, we can try and, uh, and use them to deduct all sorts of uh, interesting conclusions about the system. And before we dive in, I don't know every person and is a specific problem, but I think this is a pretty good fit. Yeah. Using these very, very simple sizes, features, super simplistic, we managed to get a pretty good fit for the data over a pretty long period of time. There's no overfitting, it's very few parameters. Okay? so. First of all, that's cool, it works. Um, then we can ask, okay, what, what can we do with this sort of, um, uh, of model? And, and I'll give an example here. The, the, this is what we saw before. So the R squared is about 0 0.9. The first uh, power, alpha, is more or less 1. Th that, what that means is that if we increase the demand by 10%, then we expect the utilization to increase by 10%. Interesting, interestingly, the power of... Um, the supply is not one, it's actually 0 0.6, which means that if we increase a 10% increase, well, you can all read. Um, an increase in the supply is not, uh, directly uh, is not converted directly uh, into the same increase uh, or decrease in utilization. Specifically for VIA, that's actually very cool because if we double the scale, don't change anything about the system, we expect a 30% increase in utilization without changing anything. So, so this very, very simple model allows us to get to some uh, interesting and substantial uh, conclusions. Specifically, for instance, uh, speaking about operational decisions, we can decide how much we'd like to market in a certain area, and depending on what we expect the increase in demand to be, or how important it is to reduce the number of vans we expect to participate in the service tomorrow. And, also, in this case, th this is uh, relevant for undersupply. In undersupply, an increase in scale really converts to, um, to an increase in, in utilization. If we look, unfortunately, at the example uh, from, for instance, the afternoon, where we're a little le less efficient and there are more vans than we actually need. So in this sort of case, um, you can see that the parameters are more, uh, the powers are more or less the same, which means that if we increase the scale, it doesn't necessarily have any uh, positive effect out of the system because we're oversupplied. Also, um, the speed parameter is actually substantially lower because we have so many vehicles that it doesn't actually matter whether it takes a long time or, or matters less whether it takes a long time or a short time to serve a specific ride. Okay, um, so I think this model is nice, but uh, completely irrelevant to the, or almost completely irrelevant to the question that we discussed. I remind you that we were discussing how to detect low-level uh, changes on system-wide behavior, and I now presented a model that explains system-wide behavior, but uh, I, I'm not sure that, that, that that's helpful. And, and here, what we did, and I think is, is in some sense novel 
uh, is use a, use a very, very simple model, a model that more or less any of us can build each in his own domain to denoise the data. Because a very large percent of the variance in the system is actually a result of a very few or small number of uh, parameters, removing them and looking just at the residuals of the model allows us to get a much, much cleaner observation and, much, and allows us to detect things much, much quicker and, and much more easily. Um, th this is actually very common in time series. We do it just with uh, detrending, and we usually do it versus time. But here we're using a much more complex model, which is, in my opinion, pretty cool. Um, and this is a real example. Uh, you can see utilization is on the rise. And um, on the very last day in this graph, it's, we actually detected a bug using this, uh, this methodology, um, which is interesting because if you think of it, the very last point, the utilization was pretty high. It was actually better than almost throughout the whole time. So if we wouldn't use this methodology, we'd look at that and say, hey, great, another good day yesterday in the office. Everything's working well. But when we use the model, we understand that actually yesterday we underperformed our expectations. And that allows us to detect the bug, which we actually did deploy very, very quickly and efficiently. So that's a sort of example of what we can, we can do once we actually understand the system based on a very, very simple model and remove the noise. Another ex real life example is actually from the, <laughs> just recently, is um, we can look at the trend in the residuals. And in this case, you can see that there was a long period we were, where we were um, underperforming. And then uh, uh, since then, there's been a, quite a, large, a long period where we're overperforming. And then in, the, in this sort of case, um, you can actually try and understand what caused this change. Wh why, wh what happened here? What happened here that caused this shift from underperforming to overperforming? And what we really do, because the residuals, well, some of you may say, well, let's just build a model for the residuals. But the second order can be very complex and, <coughs> and very difficult to model. So what we do is we're just looking for we use this sort of plot and just line it up with all sorts of different changes that we've made over the last period and look what is correlated with the trend in the residuals. If you look at the actual uh, utilization, it's very difficult to detect the trend in the uh, utilization itself. So using this very, very th simple methodology, and it's relatively straightforward, nothing super sophisticated. We didn't go to any super sophisticated models, basic, basic SKLearn. I think we, we, we managed to create a very uh, interesting proactive monitoring tool to understand changes in our system. Uh, the next thing to think being uh, data science is how can we improve the model? And actually, this is a result of the previous trend that we look. If you can see that there is a trend, so we were trying to understand this trend. And what, th there were actually multiple changes more or less around this time. And one of them was an ex expansion of the actual zone that via serves. We expanded to a larger area in Brooklyn, and we expect that, sorry, um, we expect that expanding the zone will, may have an effect on the overall system performance. So we said, let's just add the area to the model. Sorry. Um, which sounds right, and maybe it will allow us to look at demand density rather than uh, raw demand. The problem with adding, and this is a pitfall of this sort of methodology, is that um, if you think of it, expansion, a geographical expansion specifically with VIA, is uh, correlated very strongly with time. It can be thought of as a series of step functions. So we're serving a certain area, and then we increase the zone, we're serving another a larger area, and so on. And any function that's strongly correlated with time, when we add it to the regression, the regression may use it as a dummy variable that explains what, what we're actually looking for. When specifically, what changes we're looking for are also correlated with time. We may lose them when using this sort of methodology. So then uh, Amir, who's sitting at the back, offered to use a, a real physicist um, measure and, and add entropy. You can think of using entropy rather than the actual area. The advantage of entropy is, first of all, it allows us uh, something a bit more fundamental about the system, of how the actual requests are distributed throughout the city. And also that it's much noisier. And the, the noise in this case is, is good, because it allows us to understand if really the noise is what's causing um, the changes or, or the trend. Um, so here's the definition of uh, entropy, for those of you who don't know. Um, the the, the uh, example above is an example where we have a relatively high entropy. The demand is dispersed throughout the city. And the example below, even though the actual demand can be or the number of requests can be exactly the same, is much more concentrated and is low entropy. 
or specifically in a VIA case, it would look like this. On the left, we'd have a much more dispersed demand pattern, and on the right, we'd have a more uh, concentrated demand pattern. And this is, th these are both uh, 2D proje projections, but we're actually looking at the pickup and the drop-off, which is 4D, and I couldn't push a 4D graph into the presentation, sorry. Um, okay, so we added that to the model. Just before the results, we can actually look at, at um, a graph of the entropy versus time, and we can see that, it, that there is a pretty strong trend of the entropy, and that it does vary throughout the day, so th that it seems interesting. And an important disclaimer here is that this is actually all, was all done more or less in the last couple of weeks. So if the results change next week, you're all not going to know. But uh, we added it to the model, and it actually looks like it improves it quite substantially. So we have on, on, over here is a simple model without the entropy. And R squared is about 0 0.86. And when we add um, the entropy to the, to, to the prediction, we actually get a, a, a better prediction. And I actually didn't bring this example, but sometimes it also allows us to detect or trends in a more clear and uh, um, significant way. Um, okay, that's, uh, that's it. Um, I think now that, uh, how long? 25 minutes into the lecture, you're all ride-sharing experts. You know, you all have the domain knowledge that we have, more or less. Um, I, I think any, the, the key takeaways are that using a very simple model, often it allows us to develop some useful and often very strong intuition about the problem, which can be very helpful. And using that model or a model to denoise uh, the system can allow us to get a much, much clear, cleaner and signal, which in our case allowed us very uh, proactive monitoring and, and, and much more reliable. If you think of it in Dick Cheney's words, it allowed us to d discover our unknown unknowns. Um, and this is still all in, uh, in work, and we're uh, constantly trying to understand what we're missing. Specifically, the model that I presented, which looks nice and great, I hope, um, only works, or works per city and doesn't work across cities that V is operating in. And we'd like to understand why and what we're missing or what features we're missing and how to improve it so that we can generalize between the cities. Um, yeah, that's it. Yeah. Why is Ben not model person? Why is it? Why is it not enough to be a model person? Uh, per city, in theory, it could be good enough. It, and, and that's what we've been doing. We actually worked on this for a, a long while with a model per city. If I'm completely truthful, we even worked with a model per shift, per time frame. Um, but it does mean that we're missing something. Because if there's a fundamental uh, parameter or feature that varies between the cities, we'd like to understand what it is. So, for instance, we decide where to expand to next, we can try and understand what that feature is. So, so we'd like it to work and generalize. But I agree that it's useful even without that. Yes? Is there a so th th that's a good question. Th the answer is yes, our routes aren't fixed. They're completely dynamic, which creates a completely different uh, system. It's, they're also on demand. So you order a, a ride, and you get a vehicle only when you order the ride, which I'm not saying that our problem is easier. It's actually, I think, in many aspects more difficult, but it's a very different problem. Um, yeah. Yes? <coughs> So <laughs> that's actually one of the most surprising things. Um, I'll show a nice example, because why not? Yeah, so either of these. So you can actually see that um, in the end, holidays have a major effect on the demand, a major effect on the supply, and a major effect on the speed. And the model actually many to get it pretty well. So even days that are completely different, the parameters are completely different, out of sample, what we'd call, uh, actually the model generalizes pretty well for them. Yeah, sorry. So we took all the requests, we discretized um, the, the, the four-dimensional um, pickup and drop-off area geographically, and then we calculate the probability of each uh, discretized uh, area. It's not an area, but a four-dimensional area. And once we have a probability, then we calculate the probability times the logarithm of the probability and get a measure for the entropy.
And once we have the entropy, we just add it to the linear model, a logarithm of it, to the linear model. Uh, I'm time up. Another it's another feature. Yeah, another feature in the model. Sorry, if that wasn't clear. Okay, good.